low. Can everyone hear me? Too loud, too low? I can go louder if people are sleepy as well. Okay. Thank you for coming to this session and to this Selenium conference. Uh, it's been very, very exciting uh, being here. Uh, so much to learn and share and uh, talk with fellow members of the community. And purposely, because my uh, session is post-lunch, I chose the bright pink color, which I'm guessing is not too bright to wake everyone up. But I hope it does add to some effect. Uh, the topic is supposed to be the what, why, and how of web analytics testing. But I decided to make a slight tweak to it. I'm going to drop the web off. Analytics is much more than just web in the sense of a web browser. And we'll see how that goes forward. <clears throat> Very quick information about myself. I've been doing uh, in the testing field for quite a few years now. And really enjoy being part of this field. And there's so much to learn and contribute. And it never really gets old. So my Twitter ID, uh, hashtag is there. Uh, the slides would be available, of course, uh, from my blog and slide share. And really looking forward to having more interactions with everyone. Uh, the rest of the day today as well as tomorrow. Enough about myself. Let's start with asking you a question. What do you expect from this? You chose wisely by coming here. What would you expect from this? Anyone? Excellent. We will be covering that aspect. We will be covering that. Anyone else? Yes? So I saw you work with a mobile company which serves videos on mobile. Right. Even we have similar products. I'm more interested how you do analytics on mobile and how you automate it. OK, excellent. I'll just repeat the question uh, for everyone's benefit. So my current profile is I'm working in a startup of, um, with, in the domain of entertainment, serving video content of movies or uh, TV shows on mobile devices as well as the browser in specific regions. And we'll be talking a little bit about that as well as a case study of very few minutes. And the question was, he's interested to know how uh, does analytics fit into that and how is automation also happening in that space. And we'll be covering that aspect as well. OK, so feel free to uh, pause me at any point in time if you have any questions or want to talk a little bit more about any of the things that we'll be uh, going through. And let's get started with this. OK, so analytics. It's not just about the web browser anymore. Uh, it is not just about the mobile anymore. There could be various other aspects as well. And what does it really mean? Why do we need analytics in the first place? Anyone, has anyone worked on analytics over here? Few people, yeah? Great, so not too many. Why do we need analytics, right? The most important thing is to understand what and how the product is being used. And based on that, make changes to your product, tweak it, and uh, fine tune it to make that value proposition of the product really come out for the consumer, have it deliver the value. And how, will, how are we going to achieve this? We achieve this by capturing the data from your product as it is being used by consumers. And you put it in a central place of sorts, and you make some analysis on top of it. And based on that, you would create various dashboards and uh, different kinds of reports to understand what is your product doing for the consumer in the real world. And that is very important to uh, understand, because a lot of decisions of how your product needs to grow is dependent on that aspect. Okay? A quick example uh, could be, this is uh, my blog, uh, Google Analytics uh, Simple Dashboard that comes out of the box. And if my objective is I want to increase my reach from a blog perspective, how is that going on so far? There are simple techniques I could potentially use looking at this data. If I do a blog post at a certain time of the day or a certain day of the week, there probably is a bigger reach in terms of the user base that is there. So this is simple information that comes out of the box from Google Analytics for uh, the blogger website. Okay? Now, there are various different analytics solutions that uh, would be there. Simple ones could be Google Analytics, Site Catalyst, which I believe has uh, now become part of the Adobe suite. Uh, Amplitude is there, Web Trends is there. There are so many. In fact, a lot of companies, they end up building their own custom solution as well, because the standard solutions are not really giving them the kind of insight that they would really want. Okay. Is that all to analytics, though? Not really. 
there are new kids in town, right? Uh, what we have heard them as IoT and big data. Wait a minute, which, which year are we in? It's not really kids anymore. They've probably become teenagers now. These terms have been around for quite some time, and there is more and more applications being built on top of it. Can any one of you name a few applications of IoT or big data? Alexa, Alexa one. What else? Smart homes. Smart cars. There's so many things, right? Uh, simple things like a smart power, uh, you know, power strip. You can control it, toggle it on and off uh, using your mobile or something. There are so many different applications that are coming up as a result of these new terminologies where more value propositions are uh, being provided to the consumer. So IoT helps us to enable new value propositions for our uh, users. It helps us be more innovative and creative in this aspect. And what it really does, if you look at it, it helps us automate the manual process that you would be doing. I don't want to get up and switch on the light in my room. Let me just control it automatically. Maybe there are sensors which, based on settings, will automatically control that aspect as well. Right? I don't even need to uh, do anything over there. The way this would work is, to deliver value, you need to start collecting data from all of these different connected devices that are there, or these devices that we want to bring under a certain connection platform. You keep on collecting it. You keep on repeating that collection over and over again. You keep on analyzing it and start making decisions on top of it. Okay? And this is where a lot of another new set of uh, terminology comes into being, machine learning, artificial intelligence. It's looking at this data and making more meaningful uh, sense out of that. Okay? More important than uh, all of that is it provides an opportunity to understand the data and start tweaking your product how to make it better. Okay? And this whole cycle keeps repeating again. Now, with IoT, big data comes very naturally in my opinion. The volume of data being generated with all these connected devices is huge. This example talks about a jet engine which collects almost one terabyte of data per flight. And that data is not just collected for the sake of collecting. You need to make some meaning out of it. Now, how do you analyze that one terabyte of data for one flight when there are thousands of flights going on at the same time uh, that are flying around in the sky? How do I make meaning out of those? Right? It becomes very, very important and challenging aspect. And as a result, IoT leads to massive amounts of data as well with all these devices connected. How do you, uh, what do you do with that data? Coming back to our core topic, it's a testing conference. Enough about buzzwords and uh, the new opportunities that might be there. What does this all really mean from a testing perspective? So what we have is, in order to do testing in this way of working, we need to have a lot of capabilities and skills that we need to build and upskill ourselves in various different ways. We need to be able to make sure that the data collection is really working well. It's not just about a browser. Is it making a request? Am I able to search for a product or not? This is much, much more deeper than that. All these millions of devices that are now talking to each other all of a sudden, is that really going to be reliable or not? And how do you test for that reliability across all these different sources, for different uh, protocols, different ways of communication that would be there? Once you start collecting that data is the next phase from an analyzing perspective. It's not just for data scientists to look at that volume of data. I've collected it correctly. Now you do something, run some algorithms. How do you build those algorithms? How do you ensure those algorithms are really correct or not? Are they providing you the right inference from that data uh, and making uh, good suggestions out of that. And of course, based on that, how do you feed that type of information back again into your product to say, what changes am I going to do? What experiments am I going to do out of this to make my product better, to get the value delivered in a better way? Okay? And all of this, of course, provides new opportunities for us as testers in the field or any other role in the field to do more under, uh, research, more understanding into what really is going on in this uh, massive uh, fragmented set of devices, and how do we make that better? Okay. So one is about 
testing all these integrations. The other aspect is also from an NFR perspective, if you really look at it, I cannot just get stuck on collecting the data. It's also about performance, reliability, security, and of course, the scale side of it. It's not just I've deployed a build, I'm going to test the functionality, I'm done with it. Okay? So from a testing perspective, these kind of products, these type of integrations are creating very, very new opportunities for us, and we need to take that step forward to make it better for ourselves and for the consumers who are going to be using it. Let's take a simpler example, though, to really understand how we would get into the how do we really test for analytics and the value proposition it uh, brings for us. So this is the product I was talking about uh, uh, when we began. It's a mobile app, Android, iOS, and we serve localized content uh, for different regions that uh, our product is available for. The unique aspect about this product, though it's in a very early stage of uh, implementation and adoption, we have more than 1.75 million unique installs on Android itself. We've got more than 13,000 unique Android devices that are being used by our consumers to use our uh, product. Now, what does that really mean? Why is that important? From a testing perspective, there's only so much we can do from in-house before we release a build to Play Store or App Store, or from a website perspective as well. But with that limited testing, it's never going to be able to cover the real-world scenarios, the real uh, data fluctuations that happen when people are moving on the uh, road or going from one place to another. How is the product really behaving from that? As a result, the product in uh, this space especially, a lot of data is uh, looked at is not in terms of installs, uninstalls, but what is really happening from the field in terms of user engagement, the amount of time users are spending on the app, how often are they coming back, and various metrics related to that. Now, this is something we cannot really measure in-house because this is real user data. We can test basic things about is this information getting captured correctly, but there is a lot of information from after you release the app to production to Play Store and really start making inferences out of it. What this also means is this uh, will give you trends about what is happening and tweak your testing strategy. So immediately you start feeding in data from real world, coming back into your development and testing cycles to make the product better and learn from what probably did not go as well in the past. Okay? So this is what analytics really gives us, right? Ability to understand what the consumers are going through in terms of their experience, make business decisions, and also help us feed it back into our product life cycle to make the product better. Let's get into the core nitty gritties of now, how would you really test this? Any questions so far, though? All good? OK. So let's get into the testing side of it, right? One way to test analytics is to look at the end report. We saw some reports earlier, right? These are the end reports. Everything is set up. The app is released uh, to market, and whatever that really means. And consumers or your users are actually using the product and giving you insights into how they are using it and how can you help uh, understand those patterns and do meaningful decisions on that. This becomes very important, especially in the context of a product like ours, where it's a freemium model product, where analytics is not just telling you the user patterns. Because it's a freemium product, which means ads are going to be served uh, during video streaming or whichever other ways, there's also revenue impact based on what you are, uh, users are doing with the app. So what that would mean is if my data collection or sending the data first and then collecting it is not going to be correct, my revenues are going to go for a toss. It can be a huge impact, especially for a small product that is there. So it's not just understanding user patterns. It's actually taking business decisions and revenue models out of that. Okay? So likewise, I could look at my blog post after I've, done, uh, uh, I've published a blog post, and then I could say, OK, I changed the time when I'm going to publish it and the day. Is, am I seeing any impact out of that? Maybe I should try something else. So depending on the objective of your product, you could start creating strategies based on the data that you are seeing. But this is all about testing the end product. What it means is I have my product created. I have set up the analytics correctly. I have set up the reports correctly for it to start collecting the data and showing me meaningful information around it. The advantage of this means, yes, I'm going to know exactly what is going to happen when real users are going to be using it. But 
I need to have my report set up correctly for that to happen. The con is potentially it could be licensing issues or having reports not yet set up uh, in your test ecosystem for you to validate before it goes live. And at the same time, how do you really ensure that all the requests that are going through, are they correct or not? I'll take an example over here. Let's say all of us in the room, if you have to go to some particular website, Amazon or whichever website, right? And we are going or routing it all through a proxy server, which is connect, now I have it on my machine. And I would see, okay, probably there are 60, 70 people in the room, 70 people making the same request from their phones or their machines or the tablets. I should see those many requests come in over here. So I can make sense out of what OS, what device is being used, and I can start making inferences based on that data. But wait a minute, there's 70 people, I just see 65. Which of those five requests did not make it over here? Or instead of 70, I see 80 requests come in. How come there are 10 extra requests coming in? With this end report kind of approach, that becomes a huge challenge. You will not be able to figure out if the specifics are working correct or not. If on a very old version of Android, for some reason, it is not able to send that request for analytics or not. It will be very difficult to capture that. And that becomes the biggest problem, that it is too late. Your development is done, your testing is done, but the, but the time you set up the report and start looking at the data, everyone has moved on to doing other things. It becomes too late. The feedback cycle is too late. So the solution, if it is too late, of course, let's bring it upstream. Let's test this at the source. Now, what does that really mean? If you open up your browser, go to DevTools uh, or any such uh, uh, means where you can look at the requests that are going out. For analytics, there are certain requests that go based on actions. It could be page load or certain specific action that the user is doing. There'll be a special request sent to the analytics server with relevant information tagged along with it. Now, what you could do is, in that case, you've opened up a page with DevTools and with uh, the network tab, you could start filtering the specific request which is going to your analytics server, and you could check immediately, I clicked on this particular uh, button, or I did this particular action on my product. I should be sending a specific set of information to the analytics server as part of this action. And I would find that specific request, I would look at the parameters that are sent along with it, and that becomes validation at the source. I can immediately say, based on my browser, network condition, what OS, any other parameters that are there, is the request getting sent correctly or not? Now, what this means, though, is advantage. I don't need to have a report set up yet. I don't need to wait for that to happen to ensure my functional implementation has gone through correctly or not. So this is at the source. And this is not just for a web browser. You could do the same for a native app as well on Android or iOS by setting up proxy server in between and routing the request through that proxy server. You could capture that specific request, look at the parameters, which is a JSON object in this case with name value pairs, and you could see in there, is the correct information being sent or not? And that becomes really very powerful. Okay? With me so far? So testing the end report, and then we get to testing this at the source as it happens. But now, what are the challenges you think that come across because of this? Do you foresee any challenges here? Absolutely. No, the statement was. Uh, it is hard to check this manually every time uh, because there are so many requests that are going in. And I'll expand on that a little bit. It's not just so many requests, but it is so many combinations from which the request would be going in. If you just take a browser OS combination, that itself is a big thing, right? And maybe your product is dependent on that aspect as well. You add to it the complexity of Android and iOS as well. iOS is still better from that perspective. There's limited set of uh, OS versions that would be there, or the device versions. But on Android, 13,000 plus unique devices. 
so many different versions of the operating system and not just stock OS, they could be customized OS as well. How do I know if the requests are going through correctly every time or not? And to add to that, it's not just the combination, it's the iterative approach of our development and testing these days, uh, assuming we are all uh, working in some form of agile or iterative waterfall for that matter, where functionality is being released to production, to our consumers on a very frequent basis. You have to repeat this whole activity many, many times. So the biggest challenge is that it is manual. You keep on collecting it and you keep on analyzing it every time manually. The cycle keeps on going on and as a result, you are going to end up missing something. You are going to end up not able to cover all aspects of testing for these types of events in a repeatable fashion. To add to this, I want to uh, share another complexity from a mobile device perspective. So, to reduce chattiness over the web about for each action sending data to analytics server, a lot of these analytics uh, solutions for mobile devices especially, they've got a client-side SDK which is embedded in the app. And as part of doing actions, the SDK will actually get the actions. And it does some form of batching or caching, whatever is required, queuing mechanism. It will collect a bunch of requests and then periodically it will send all those requests to the analytics server. So this becomes even more tricky for our app, for example, if I want to see if someone has, click, uh, has started playing a video, I will not see that event immediately even through a proxy because the SDK is going to capture some of these events and batch it together and at some other action, maybe it is app close or after a certain duration, it will say, okay, now I've got five, six events that I have batched up, let me send these together. So even for manual testing, for these events on mobile apps, it becomes even more of a challenge because I'm not going to see that event come up immediately. And the repeated cycle, again, it's going to make it much more complex, right? But this gives us a way to understand what our product is supposed to be doing. Are we going to be able to measure it correctly or not? We are able to see the end report, which can be set up for your test environments or for your internal builds, see if it is coming together. And then with testing at the source, as part of story testing or whichever way, you'll be able to verify as the implementation is happening, as the testing of that implementation is happening, is the analytics part also done correctly or not, okay? But this, of course, cannot scale. And that's why the next logical step is if I know what to test and how to test, why not automate that testing approach as well? To test this, uh, I actually went through this pain about, uh, I think it's almost eight years ago, testing a browser-based analytics uh, implementation that was there. And it was a nightmare. So as a result, I created this open source framework called Web Analytics Automation Testing Framework. And it plugs into your existing automation framework uh, very easily. And you would be able to start doing your uh, automating this aspect of analytics as well as part of this. What this does for me is, with minimal changes, as part of your functional implementation, you will also now be able to verify the corresponding events are being sent correctly or not. Okay, so you're, as you keep on adding more functional tests, functional tests are going to trigger the events to your anal analytics solution, and you'll be able to start validating that aspect as well. It is independent of the web analytic tool, it is independent of what type of driver you're using, and uh, browser independent, and recently, recently still about a year and a half ago, uh, I also updated the Java version of this to work with mobile apps as well, native apps uh, for iOS as well as Android, native and mobile browser for that matter. This is one part. The other very interesting thing that uh, I was able to do in my current uh, profile is for native apps, because of our reliance on uh, the functional test to drive sanity uh, for the uh, app. And analytics being so crucial to this, not just understanding what the product is doing, but to drive revenues as well, understand revenues as well. We did a very uh, interesting solution for this. As part of our automation uh, for Android, we created a special debug build. The debug build used to send data to a different analytics 
uh, bucket per se. It, it is not going to send it to where production or, con or consumers are going to be sending the data. So as part of internal testing, all our data events, analytics events are going to go to a different uh, part of the analytics solution, as well as we enabled very verbose logging by working with the devs to get all that information added in the uh, console logs for Android, which goes as part of Logcat. Now, any action done by the user on the app or as part of by the test, it is going to send some event to a different analytics bucket. And at the same time, it's going to log that information, what was that event, and the details of that event in Logcat as well. After the functional test finishes execution, we get that Logcat from the device. And using very simple techniques and uh, Linux-based commands like grep, awk, and whatever else is required, find out the relevant events that were parsed, uh, that were sent to analytics, and based on that, do assertions. So again, extending the existing functional automation to leverage, get the logcat out, parse it, and do assertions on that. And simple logic in terms of which event should be skipped, which should not be skipped. Also, certain values in analytics could be uh, runtime based, right? User ID created, for example. There could be some GUID type value that would be there. So in the assertions, we created various different types of assertions. There should be a key present in the event. I need user ID as a key present in the event that is being sent. I don't care about the value. As long as the key is there, that is good for me. I want the play duration to be less than, uh, or rather greater than, uh, let's say, five seconds. Because I'm running a test which is going to play a video, I'm going to play it for at least five seconds before I do my next action. My test knows that. So in my assertion, I'm going to say my play duration has to be greater than five seconds. Because as part of automation, it takes some time to interact with the uh, app and do those actions, right? So play duration will be greater than five anyway. Likewise, there should be some values which, are, uh, which should not be less than a certain value. So we added various different combinations of what type of assertions can be done over here. And as a result, very quickly, in a couple of days, I could extend my APM-based automation framework to also do analytics automation for this, as long as the devs have cooperated and helped build those into the debug logs for me. Okay? So I hope this gives an insight into why analytics is important. What is analytics, first of all? Why is it important? What is the impact on business as well as on their teams, internal teams as well, engineering teams? How to use that data and make meaning out of it? And not just that, how can we test it? We can test it at the end report. We can test it at the source. And we can automate it with some unique solution that works in the context of your team and your product. Okay? With that, thank you so much for your time. I hope this gave some insights uh, into this. And I believe we have time for uh, questions. So happy to take that. Uh, you mentioned about Android. How about iOS? On iOS is, a, iOS is a different beast altogether. And we are getting there, but the approach is going to be on similar lines. Get a debug build created specially for automation. And as part of that build, enable logging in some form. Maybe it has to be a custom solution. There probably is no such thing like console logs in the iOS side. But how can you dump out information to another file, for example, which you can try and access? And potentially, this would work. But we've not yet implemented on the iOS side. Uh, uh, my team uses heavy A-B testing. So when it comes to A-B testing, how we can use the analytic testing? It becomes even more powerful for A-B testing. So A-B testing is more at the feature level, or it's controlled. The flags are controlled in a separate way, right? Yeah. As part of your functional testing or analytics testing, it does not really matter. Okay. As far as testing analytics, as long as you have some form of functional automation for that particular type of functionality, and your automation framework can say, oh, this is part A or uh, branch A or branch B of that functionality. And I'm going to work accordingly, implement the functionality, or rather test the functionality accordingly. Then it's a matter of knowing what the test has done and knowing what paths to test from an analytics perspective from the logs. Right? That's quite difficult to find out the A-B test, because 
uh, the A-B test going to be very random. We are using launch directly to randomize sure. it. So yeah. uh, it's quite, we don't understand whether it belongs to A or B. Sometimes we use C also. Sure. So how can we automate it in that case? So you're talking just functional or analytics side? Both. OK. So functional side, what I've done in the past from a web perspective is either you get the devs to build some hooks in the product to tell you what path you want to take as a hardwired thing, right? I want to test shopping cart experience for path A, path B, path C. And I'm going to maybe pass an additional flag or something in the URL or in the header uh, to understand uh, or to force behavior in that fashion. Now, when you know that, then your functionality is clear. You know what to expect. As a result, you also know what type of analytics events to expect as part of it. If that is not possible, then potentially what you could do is have more logic embedded in your framework to say, I'm supposed to be clicking or doing search. Now, search based on A-B testing or A-B-C testing is going to have different implementations. How can I uniquely find out which of these implementations is there, A, B, or C? And based on that, you would take that branch from an implementation. Your business logic is still the same from a test intent perspective. I want to do search. How I am doing search is an implementation detail where your framework can potentially have different implementation paths. But then based on that, again, you know your framework knows what you have done. Likewise, for your analytics validation, you would know, oh, this was path A, so I need to take the events from path A and capture that aspect, validate on that. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, we have a quite complex uh, application we're working on, and uh, we have uh, really tons of requests with uh, to analytics. We are using Site Catalyst. Um, and maybe you know some approach how to handle the um, existing application with a lot of tracking inside and uh, how to automate the tests for it, because the defining request by request is it's very hard and uh, it's a lot of work. Correct. And maybe there is a way uh, how to, for example, check it once manually and run some, some tool to capture the data and uh, yeah. define it as, as test. Yeah. Um, I think a, a great question. The approach that I've said probably does not scale to that level of volume of requests coming in, and rightly so, because the approach I've uh, shared is from a functional testing perspective for I do a certain set of actions, maybe I do five, 10 actions, and I expect 20, 30, 40 events out of it in the course of those actions. But, and that part should scale, uh, still scale fine uh, from a performance uh, and execution perspective as well. But if there is a massive number of uh, requests, a huge volume of requests, you should potentially look at a different approach altogether, where you're sending those requests via a proxy server to another server where it's being analyzed and validated separately as an offline process. So you have a huge volume of requests in another analytics server, which you are going to come in separately and do validations on top of that, not as part of your functional validation. And maybe finding patterns out of that to see if there's any anomaly or not. But the challenge with volume uh, of uh, requests, a huge volume of requests, is to pinpoint where the problem really happened. That's why in simple mathematics terms, right, in equations, if you reduce the number of variables, solving the problem becomes much more easier. If the number of requests is huge, understanding which request did not work as expected or does not have the data as expected is going to be more problematic. So you have to isolate the problem from a functional perspective, have a slightly different approach, Maybe from a functional perspective, if you're generating a huge volume of data, maybe the, this approach might not work. Send it via proxy server to another server place, and you analyze it separately. Um, well, we are doing something similar. We have um, in uh, Selenium WebDriver, uh, we have a built-in uh, feature for uh, capturing the requests, and we are just checking, defining manually in the test uh, if uh, some value appears or not. Right. Yeah, that might uh, also work. So we can probably talk more uh, separately on this specific thing. Uh, I probably also would need to understand a little bit more, and maybe your, what you've implemented might be good insights for me as well in that one. Right. We have about another six or seven minutes. OK. Yeah. We can. Yeah. Uh, I think this is uh, more basic. 
currently we are trying out two paid SDKs, Fabric and Mixpanel, to do the analytics. And when I pay for that SDK, I assume it just works. So in that case, why shall I do analytics testing? Correct. Uh, very good question again. If you are using some library free or paid, uh, or a SDK in this case, why should you pay for that, right? You want to ensure your basic application functionality is working. In the case of my mobile app where I spoke about the Amplitude SDK batching the request and sending it together, I don't even want to test if the SDK is working correctly or not. I don't even care how the requests are sent. But as long as my app is triggering those requests correctly, that is very important to me. That is the part I am focused on. The end report is not about testing the SDK. It's about more testing the integration. I'm using this library. Am I using it in the correct fashion that I'm OK, instead of 70, I get 65 or 80 requests. But are there, is the data coming through? That is the extent of my testing with that analytic solution. But the focus is more on, in this combination, on a device with very high CPU usage and a lot of other activities going on on the device in the background, are my events still getting triggered correctly? Right? So the focus has to be very clearly understood what is required for it. And then based on that, you would take your approach. Um, hey. Hey. Um, uh, I want to refer to the part where you talked about the way you test the Android SDK. And um, you were talking about the fact that you are um, printing logs, and then you're um, matching the logs to what has been received to the server. And you did mention, uh, for the case of a lot of network requests, that um, you'd probably use a proxy. So I wanted to know why did you um, even consider different methods, such as uh, recording all the network requests and uh, analyzing them over checking it on the, the server side, or uh, I mean, instead yeah. of using logs. So yeah. So uh, let me clear that uh, aspect. Uh, so my testing approach for Android app, what we are doing, the debug build that would generate those requests, and printing those requests whenever actions are done. Our extent of testing is, does it come to the logs itself? It's not about, does it go to the report as well? The reason that aspect of sending it to a different report than where your production numbers would be going is to make sure your production numbers are not going to get polluted because of that. Our tests run hundreds of times a day across a bunch of about 20, 25 devices I have in the lab. And I don't want to make sure my production numbers are going to change, so it goes in a different direction. Yeah, no, I understand that. What, what, I'll rephrase my question. Okay. Um, did you consider instead of sending it to um, your production environment or printing it to the logs, um, other practices such as recording all the network requests or you know monitoring okay. different parts of it over using logs for that? Matter? Okay. No, no, we did not really consider that uh, uh, because the important thing is from a functional perspective, if a user is saying skip add. I want to know how many people are actually clicking on that, right? And unless I play the video and do that action, I'll not be able to really get that uh, tie-in of the functionality and generation of the event. So, but that's an interesting approach. Maybe I'll catch up with you separately to understand more how that can also help out. Yeah. Thanks. I've lost you. Oh, there you <laughs> Can I pass that down? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering what you do in the case where a user is using uh, incognito or a private browser or an ad blocker, some sort of uh, thing that would, would make it more difficult to track. Oh, very interesting. Uh, so from a Native app perspective, that does not really come into picture uh, as much. From a browser, because if the functionality is working, even with an ad blocker, it's not a problem. As long as the app is trying to make the request to, OK, I need to serve an ad. Get me an ad over here, right? As long as the functionality is working correctly about I'm making a request, 
Now, why is it getting blocked? That's a separate area of investigation. Or what should be the functionality if it gets blocked? What should I do next? That's a separate area of implementation, right? So to your specific question, ad blockers or recognito mode, it does not really make a difference. As long as your product is working correctly in that type of setup, then the events it needs to generate can still be tested in various different conditions. Right? Okay, so I guess Ruth has done enough running around. So thanks, Ruth, for that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, appreciate your time.